Hi there, I'm Brad, and this is more online video content for my Music Humanities class. Um, in this video, we're going to be following up on our discussion of Impressionism and talking about two composers that are also identified with the Impressionist movement. The first one is Eric Satie, and he's just a funny, wonderful guy. Um, he was born in 1866, and he died in 1925. Um... He was born in a town called Honfleur, which is over on the coast near Le Havre, um, right across from England. And um, his, uh, his dad was a translator. His mother died when he was very young, so he pretty much grew up with his grandparents. Um, and like Debussy, he wound up going to Paris. He had some musical talent and was accepted into the Paris Conservatoire. Um, but didn't do as well as Debussy did. He was very quickly labeled as completely untalented and... Um, pretty much dismissed from the conservatoire. So for a while, he kind of lived on inherited money, and uh, then he, he became a cabaret pianist, and that's kind of how he made his way. And in fact, he became pretty well known for his humorous piano pieces and became rather popular. Um, yeah, and his pieces were quite something. Um, he was also a very close friend of a, a guy named Tristan Zara, who we're going to be talking about in the future video, kind of the founder of the Dada movement. And Eric Satie uh, oh, is a big part of that founding too, because he had a really nice focused sense of the absurd. Um, let me play you a piece that kind of demonstrates that. It's called Vexations. So it's a melody. Uh, you play it once, and then you play it with some harmony. Um, but here's the thing. You're supposed to play it 840 times. Now, it's not. I don't think this was published or performed in Satie's lifetime, but it's surprisingly performed quite often today just because it's such a peculiar piece. You know, Let me write that one down for you. Vexations. Um, and... It, to do it, it takes, you know, easily nine or ten hours. It's a, it's quite a marathon to do this. Um, sometimes they even have, like, pianists that kind of do tag team trade-offs when they're performing this piece. But again, that shows you he's he had quite a sense of humor. Um, another example of that was uh, Claude Debussy was trying to help him out a little bit. And uh, Debussy was a, you know, very talented and, and respected composer. And he said, Eric, you should use more form in your pieces. So, <laughs> Sati decided to write this. It's one of his three pieces in the form of a pair. It's the title. So, you know, this is this is delightfully silly music, but it's also quite uh, quite profound in a way, too. You know, I mean, definitely an impressionist piece because the form, it just kind of doesn't exist. It just kind of toodles along and, you know, it's kind of like um, Sati was improvising at the piano. Um, but he did all kinds of stuff like that. He had another set of pieces that he called, uh, the title was Three Flabby Preludes for a Dog. 
Um, but one of my favorite things that he did was, you know, a lot of times, you know, especially in the end of the Romantic era, composers would mark sort of things in their music about how to play it, you know, agitato, you know, or they'd say with passion, you know, or something like that. So Satie's music has instructions like, these are quotes, um, play like a nightingale with a toothache, or another one, with astonishment, or this one, just try to figure out what this means, from the top of the teeth, and then sheepishly. So as you play his music, you're supposed to, you know, keep those exhortations in mind. Um, but I don't want to belittle his music because it really was just kind of special. Um, his his most famous work is a, a set of three pieces that he titled his Gymnopédie. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and... They're just, they just sit out there. A gymnopede was apparently some kind of a dance that um, Greek warriors would do when they'd won or something like that. Um, it's not clear exactly what Satie meant by this. Probably wasn't clear to him either. But uh, these are well-known pieces. Um, let me play you um, his gymnopede one um, a bit, and you can get a sense of this. Again, these are all on my website, too. Here we go. <laughs> So it just has kind of a, a timeless quality to it, you know. Again, very impressionistic. Um, this has been used in a lot of movies. Uh, you may have heard an orchestra version of this. Debussy actually orchestrated the first and the third of Satie's pieces because he was so taken with the melodies. Um, beautiful, elegant stuff. Now, unfortunately, Satie developed a real fondness for the drink absinthe. Um, in fact, quite a fondness, and um, he ultimately died of cirrhosis of the liver, which was too bad. Um, but let me move on. The next composer we're going to talk about, again, you know, identified as being kind of impressionistic, is Maurice Ravel. And he was a little bit younger than these other guys. You know, he was born in 1875 and died in 1937. And uh, he was born down near the Spanish border in a Basque town. Um, his father was a, a pretty educated, well-known engineer. Uh, in fact, he, he designed uh, a circus ride that was quite popular, kind of like what we call the Tilt-A-Whirl now, only um, it fell out of popularity when several people died in an accident. But again, that didn't take away from his engineering talents. Uh, well, whatever. But uh, yeah, you know, he, he also kind of, you know, had some precocious music talent, uh, kind of emigrated, migrated up to Paris and did go to the Paris Conservatoire. Um, he was also labeled as too avant-garde. Um, he hung out with Debussy. Uh, they became pretty good friends, but uh, at some point uh, later in their lives, they had a falling out, and it's not clear exactly why. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Ravel was pretty well known. Uh, he made a living, you know, outside of the conservatoire by teaching. Uh, he had composition students, and uh, by composing, he received a number of commissions. A very famous one was from uh, 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 Ludwig Wittgenstein's brother, um, who had lost his his uh, right arm in the uh, First World War, and commissioned a piece from Ravel for the left hand only. It's a left-handed piano concerto. It's quite something. Um, so he did okay. Uh, towards the end of his life, he had an unfortunate accident in a taxi and developed a lesion in his brain. And several years later, that became, you know, pretty pronounced. And, and he died from the from surgery trying to correct the problem. But uh, yeah, he, he also had that very timeless kind of impressionist aspect. And you may have heard his most famous piece is a work that he titled Bolero. 
And in fact, a bolero is a type of rhythm that's done in, in certain Latin music. Like that. Um, and here it is. I'll just play this. I'm going to skip through it a little bit because it's a beautiful piece. And again, very different approach to form. It just kind of builds up and builds up, you know, almost like Purcell's, um, uh, not Purcell, uh, Paco Bell's Canon. You know, it just kind of repeats. And, and Ravel was a master orchestrator. And uh, yeah, in fact, he's the one that orchestrated Mazorsky's pictures in an exhibition. But uh, here we go. I want to play this a bit. So it has that kind of uh, exoticism that Debussy went through with his gamelan music, for example, you know. But here's later on, it's building up a bit. And that's a, a fairly new instrument to the orchestra that he's using here. It's a saxophone. And then let me run it ahead a bit more, and it starts getting more thicker and thicker. then it winds up with a big dramatic ending. So quite a piece, quite a piece. Um, anyhow, um, but, you know, I wanted to talk about Ravel mainly because I just want to play this piece. It's called A Pavain for a Sleeping Beauty. Okay, uh, part of my capitalization is probably wrong there. And it's part of a, a series of pieces he did that was, he called his Mother Goose Suite. And um, Ravel was a was an avowed bachelor for his whole life, um, but he loved children, um, his friend's children, and he wrote this for two of his closest friends who had a, a son and a daughter, and it was ultimately made into a ballet, and Ravel uh, originally wrote it for piano, probably just played it for the kids, um, I think four hands even, yeah, he'd probably play it with somebody else for the kids, uh, but then he reorchestrated it for this ballet, for this suite, and I just, I love this piece of music. It's very short. I'm going to play the whole thing. Um, and it really just has a beautiful, beautiful melody. So this is the Pavane for the Sleeping Beauty.
it's just a beautiful piece. And we'll stop it there. <laughs>